Praise the Lord, saints, and welcome back to FFT, Food for Thought Ministries, where we move with purpose and our walk with Christ over here. My name is Rokisha Muhammad, and welcome to my channel. To all my new subscribers, welcome, welcome, welcome to all my day ones. Welcome back. Amen. Today, I'm going to do, I guess I'm going to call this a study with me. Um, I was just reading chapter um, seven um, in a devotion I was doing earlier, and I just read the whole thing through, and I was like, oh, this is good. I want to dig deeper, and then the Holy Spirit said, film it, so here I am, right? So since I was going to do it anyway, I said I might as well share so we can just get into this word today, so please get you a Bible or two, get you a journal or some note paper, a pen, a highlighter, and let's get ready to dig in. We are basically focusing on the whole chapter seven, and I, I'm well. We're really focusing on John chapter seven, verse five, um, and the focus is going to be credible witnesses. But I want to read the whole chapter seven because I want to give this in full context, right? And the whole story is good. And oh, I am going to be getting the um, application points from this here, apply the word study Bible. And I do have a full review on this Bible. Excellent Bible. I love it. So I said, I'm going to use my Bibles, which I already do, but I just want to show y'all that I use them, right? So we might as well just take advantage of this study time. But our focus is going to be John 7 and 5, but we're going to read the full chapter 7, amen, because the story is just good. And it's a lot of points that we can pull out. Um, I might break out the commentary. Um, I might not. I'm definitely going to be reading some study notes in the Bible as well. But what I am going to do, we're going to use this as my, as our application study point, which is in the applied study Bible. But I want to actually read chapter seven in my amplified only because it's just a little bit more juicy to me in the amplified. So I'm going to move this to the side because we're going to get our study and application from the apply the word study bible new king james but i want to actually read it in the amplified because it's just juicier to me y'all i'm sorry so i'm just gonna do what i do you do what you do and we're just gonna be happy in jesus amen so let's go and read chapter seven um in the amplified study bible and then we'll go back to the new king james um apply the word study bible and take the lesson up there so i hope you got your pens your paper and your highlighters get your bible out okay because we're about to read through this thing and it's gonna get juicy this is a good story so i hope you're ready i don't know how long this is gonna be but however long it is is how long it is if you don't want to stay click off amen so here we go study time with me all right chapter seven and in this bible it is entitled Jesus teaches at the feast. Can y'all see? Let me bring y'all down a little bit. Because I'd like y'all to be able to see what's happening. All right, here we go, y'all. We're about to read this. Whole chapter 7. And it says, After this, Jesus walked from place to place in Galilee. For he would not walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jewish feast of tabernacles, booths, were approaching. So his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea so that up over here, so that your disciples there may also see the works that you do. Now he being funny. He said, no one does anything in secret when he wants to be known publicly. If you must do these things, Show yourself openly to the world and make yourself known. You see that exclamation point? Now, this is his brother talking to him, trying to be funny. Like, why are you all up in the cuts, right? Won't you go out there and be seen? Do your, Show them your miracles. And it says, for not even his brother believed in him, meaning his own brother didn't believe that he was the Messiah. All right. And it says, um, so Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but any time is right for you. 
the word the world cannot hate you since you are a part of it. Ooh, ooh, look at that. Ooh, that was a that, that was a jab. But it does but it does hate me because I denounce it and testify that his deeds are evil. Let's just slow down. I'm going to take my time today, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm going to take my time today. I'm not rushing. If you ain't got time, again, click off because this is the word of God and I'm going to take my time and this is my study time and this is just what I do, okay? So we're going to read that one more time because that was good. Listen here. Listen here. It says, So Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but any time is right for you. Why is it right for you? The world cannot hate you. Why? Since you are a part of it. Come on, Jesus. But it does not hate me. I mean, but it does hate me because I denounce it and testify that its deeds are evil. Woo! Let that marinate. Jesus ain't playing. He said the world don't hate you because you were part of the world. You over here still kicking it with Satan. They hate me because I'm telling them in their face, you're doing wrong, you're doing evil, and you need to get right. So, of course, they're going to hate me, but they don't hate you because you're a part of the world. Woo, come on, Lord. Tell them. Y'all can't tell me this ain't good. We only on <laughs> number seven. Okay, let's, let, me, let me stop. Okay. So, he said, because you're a part of it, right? He said, they denounce it. I denounce it and testify that their deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I am not going up to the feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said this thing to have said, having said these things to them, he stayed behind in Galilee. Y'all, I'm sorry. I just get excited. Forgive me. Okay. He said in Galilee, it says, but afterwards, when his brothers had gone up to the feast, he went up to not publicly with the carnival meaning he didn't go in a big old caravan. He snuck on sideways. He came in through the back door, as you could say. But quite, oh, here we go. But quietly, because he did not want to be noticed. So the Jews kept looking for him at the feast, asking, where is he? Talking about Jesus. There was a lot of whispering, discussion, and, murmur, and murmuring among the crowds about him. Oh, this is good. Okay, murmuring about the crowds against about him. So some were saying he is a good man. Others said, no, on the contrary, he misleads the people, giving them false ideas. Are y'all saying this? Yet no one was speaking out openly and freely about him for fear of the leaders of the Jews. So they ain't even being a witness. They ain't seen him do miracles, but ain't nobody about to say nothing because they don't want to get jailed. They don't want to get put in jail. So they not even saying it's taken up for Jesus. You hear me? When the feast was already half over, Jesus went up into the temple court and began to teach. Come on, Jesus, show yourself. Woo, this is good. Then the Jews were perplexed. They said, how did this man, <laughs> look at this y'all, um, become learned so versed in the scriptures and theology without formally training? Jesus answered them by saying, my teachings is not my own, but his who sent me. Come on, Jesus. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know whether the teachings is of God or whether I speak on my own accord and by my own authority. Mm, mm, mm. Whew, Jesus, he who speaks on his own accord seeks glory and honor for himself. But he who seeks the glory and the honor of the one who sent him, he is true. And there is no unrighteousness or deception in him. Now let's break this down. Let's go on and break this down. So he basically saying, if anyone is willing to do his will, who will? God's will, meaning you, you in obedient to the word of God, you following his laws and you doing what you're supposed to do. He said, you will know whether the teachings is of God because he's going to be telling you to do right. He's going to be renouncing and, 
and telling you you sinning straight up to your face. He going he to be telling you that ain't cool. That ain't okay to do that, right? He ain't going to just be up here philosophizing, speaking on his own accord so that you can marvel against him and what he doing. It's not about what man is doing. We're supposed to be out here representing God and giving the people his word for them to glorify him, right? Not for us to get the glory. Okay. So anyway, and then he's saying that whoever is doing that, following God's word, teaching the people correctly and doing what they're supposed to do, he is true. And there is no unrighteous or deception in him because I'm not trying to get you to come to me. I'm trying to get you to get go to the word like we're doing right now. We reading his word. Amen. And it says, did not Moses give you the law? Come on. Question. He asking them a question. And yet not one of you keeps the law. Come on hypocrite. That ain't what it say, but I'm just saying, while you up here trying to chastise me, Moses gave you the law, the 10 commandments, and you're not even keeping them. Why do you want to kill me for not keeping it? Come on, Jesus. Are y'all reading this? Okay. Let me calm down. Hallelujah. Whew, Jesus. Okay. Let me read that again. We're going to take our time today. Y'all we're going to take our time. It says, did not Moses give you the law? He asked them a question. And yet, not one of you keeps the law. Why do you want to kill me for not keeping it? Come on. So you see how they're a hypocrite? You saying you, you ain't keeping the law, but you want to kill me for not keeping the law. <laughs> That's so funny. The crowd answered, you have a demon. Look, this is how they do you. This is how they do you when you talk in sense. The crowd answered, you have a demon. You are out of your mind. Who wants to kill you? You see how they do you? Jesus replied, I did one work and you are all astound. John 5, 1 through 9. For this reason, Moses has given you God's law regarding circumcision. Not that it originated with Moses. But the but the patriarch and you circumcised the man even on the Sabbath, meaning they broke the law because you ain't supposed to be doing nothing on the Sabbath. Right. But they up there trying to check Jesus about something. He said, even on the Sabbath, if to avoid breaking the law of Moses. OK, so they broke the law because they um, circumcised this man on the Sabbath. And then it said, to avoid breaking the law of Moses, a man undergoes circumcision on the Sabbath. Why are you angry with me for making a man whole body well on the Sabbath? God healed a man on the Sabbath, right? And they was telling him he was breaking the law and he was out of line, but they circumcised the man on the Sabbath and it's okay. You see how they was hypocrites? That's why he always calling them a hypocrite. Come on, don't come check me about healing a man while you over there cutting on penises. Okay, stop it. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it says, do not judge by appearance superficially and arrogantly, but judge fairly and righteously. Come on, Jesus, talk to us. Then some of the people of Jerusalem said, is the is this not the man they wanted to kill? They asked him a question. Is this not the man, meaning this, is this not the man we wanted to kill? And he said, look, he is speaking publicly and they say nothing to him. Come on. Is it possible? I hope y'all enjoying this as I am. Is it possible that the ruler really knows that this is the Christ? But we know where this man is from. Whenever the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. See, they trying to they trying to um, basically talk people out of not believing that this is the Messiah because they say we know where he's from, but when the real one come, we ain't gonna know where he's from. If that's making sense, okay. And it says, then Jesus called out, and he taught in the temple. Come on, Jesus, you know me, and know where I'm from. And I have not come on my own initiative as self-appointed. Come on. But he who sent me is true. And him you do not know. 
Come on, Jesus. Let them know. We're going to read that again, y'all. This for the people in the back. That's a little slow. He said, you know me and know where I'm from. Okay. And I have not come on my own initiative. Meaning he ain't doing it his will. He doing his father's will. Okay. He ain't being, um, he ain't self-appointed. But he who sent him, who is God, is true. And him, you do not know. Meaning you don't know the, you don't know God. Okay. And then it says, I know him myself because I am from him. Come on, Jesus. He's he breaking it down right now. He said, I know him myself because I am from him. Who is him? God. I came from his very presence. Who presence? God presence. And it was and it was he personally who sent me. Come on, Jesus, let him know. Let him know. So they were eager to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. Look how God protected his baby. God protected his son. They did not lay a hand on him. So don't tell me what God won't do in the midst of trouble. He will always make a way of escape. You just better know who you are in Christ. Come on, somebody. And then it says, but many from the crowd believed in him and they kept saying, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs and exhibit more proofs than this man? Look, because he already been raising the dead, healing the sick and doing what he's supposed to do, showing people that he is the Christ that no man has ever done walking the earth. So who else is going to be doing these miracles? If this ain't if this ain't the Christ, who going to come greater than him? Right? This is what the, this is what the people were saying cuz they believe cuz they he, they getting signs and wonders. Amen. And here go the Pharisees. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things under their breath about him. And the chief priests and Pharisees sent guards to arrest him cuz they mad and jealous cuz they can't <laughs> they can't even get people to pay attention to them. But Jesus is over here raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons, all right? And the whole crowd is murmuring his name, and they jealous. Therefore, Jesus said, for a little while longer, I am still with you. And then I then I go home. I mean, then I go to him who sent me. Who is him, y'all? God in heaven. And then it says, you will look for me, come on, and will not be able to find me. And where I am, you cannot come. <laughs> Look at him. Woo. What is he telling them? What is he telling them on the under? What is he telling them, y'all? He said, where I'm going, you can't come. <laughs> then the Jews said among themselves, I know this is good. This is better than TV. This is what I do, y'all. This is what I do. I'm telling you, this would be good. This is juicy. Okay, it says, um... And the Jews said among themselves, where does this man intend to go that we will not be able to find him? Does he intend to go to the desperation, desperation, I don't know what that is, of the Jews scattered and the living among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? Meaning, I guess, go somewhere else to teach where you can't find him, right? Let me see. Is there a, um, is there a study note for this? What is this? 35. No, it ain't no study note for this. Okay. And it says, what does this statement of his mean? You will look for me and will not be able to find me. So now they perplexed. They trying to figure out what is he talking about? They, I ain't going to be able to find him. And where I am, you cannot come. So now they like, what he talking about? Right now, now on the last and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood and called out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Come on, somebody. He who believes in me, who adheres to, trust in, and relies on me, as the scriptures have said, from his innermost being, will flow continually rivers of living water. This is so good. Y'all hearing this? But he was speaking of the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him as Savior were to receive 
afterwards, meaning when he went up to heaven, once he got raised from the dead, right? The Holy Spirit was going to come and dwell with him. The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was still walking the earth. So the Holy Spirit did, hasn't came yet because Jesus was not yet glorified and raised to honor. Come on, somebody. Now, we're almost done, y'all. Division of the people over Jesus. Y'all can't tell me this ain't good. And, it's, and it says, listening to these words, some of the people said, this is certainly the prophet. And then it gives us these scriptures, which we really need to be going to. But for time's sake, we're not. And it says, others said, this is the Christ, the Messiah, the atonement. I mean, the, the anointed, the atonement, the anointed. But others said, surely the Christ is not going to come out of Galilee. He is, question mark. How do you know where he going to come from? And saying that he, wait a minute, I'm going to work on this. Okay, it says he is, excuse me, and it says, does the scripture not say that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? And then you see cross references. And it says, so the crowd was divided. So the crowd was divided because of him. Okay. And then it says, some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked him, and who asked them, why did you not bring him here with you? All right. I'm sorry, y'all. I was getting distracted. I got some came across my video. Let me read that again. Why did you not bring him here with you? The guards replied, never at any time has a man talked the way this man talks. Look, 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 look. They all, you see these exclamation marks? They like, um, never at any time has a man talked the way this man talked. Then the Pharisees said to them, have you also been deluded and swept off your feet? Meaning, do, did he get you too? Come on now. Has any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him? That he asked in the question. But this ignorant, contemptible crowd that does not know the law is accused and doomed. Ooh. Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus before and was one of them asked, look at Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus at night, okay? And Jesus called them to come, but he, he couldn't do it because he didn't want to get in trouble with the soul, with the Roman soldiers. So it says, but um, Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus before and was one of them asked, does our law convict someone without first giving him a hearing and finding out what is acute, what he is accused of doing? So, like, if we're going to do this, do it right. How are we just going to put him in jail and we ain't even accused him? What is he doing wrong, right? And then it says, they, they responded, are you also from Galilee? <laughs> Search and read the scriptures and see for yourself that no prophet comes from Galilee. Look at this. They're telling you to go search and look like we're doing. Read these scriptures. Y'all can't tell me this is this is better than TV. This is better. Look at this story we're reading. This is good. This, you, this is juicy. Okay, let's keep going. And everyone went his own, went to his own house. Now that's it. Now I want to keep on going, but, but I said we're just gonna read chapter seven. Okay. So we have read chapter seven. Y'all can't tell me that wasn't no good story. And this was just about, and y'all can read it the rest on your own. Hopefully that got you engaged, okay? So now let's go to our other, back to our book. Oh, my chair just a popping and cracking. Excuse that. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Well, now we're just going to read this real quick. Well, not real quick. Now I ain't going to say real quick, but. All right, so we just read. Um, and in this Bible, it's called Jesus' brother disbelief. He didn't believe, right? So 
So now, credible witness. So we're going to focus on John 7 and 5. But I just felt like that whole little story was just really good. So now, here, it says, We might feel frustrated when people we care about continue to reject God despite our continual efforts. Can y'all see this? I say that a lot. I'm going to make sure y'all see this. Let me start over. We might feel frustrated when people we care about continue to reject God despite our continual efforts. But we should remember that even the Lord's own brothers did not believe that he was the Christ. Okay, we got to remember that because we want to get ourselves, our, our children saved. We want our, our spouses to be saved, our co-workers, all our family members and friends, even our neighbors and strangers, right? And they reject God because they don't know God because they in this world. And they don't want to hear you come telling them they doomed and they going to hell. They don't want to hear that. They want to keep living their so-called best life in this world. Right. They don't want to obey. They don't want to follow no instructions. They don't want to follow no rules. OK, so listen. So so this is just an encouragement to you to say if Jesus own brother didn't believe him and want to follow, what make you think your family going to fall in line? OK, so then it says, um, but we should remember that even the Lord's own brother did not believe that he was the Christ. They saw his miracles. They listened to his teachings, yet they hesitated to accept that Jesus was the son of God. As Christians, we are responsible for communicating the good news, but it is the people who hear it who are accountable for responding in faith. That's not our job. Once they hear it, the Holy Spirit moves, and then they got to respond in faith to believe it and receive it. Amen. If we hold ourselves liable for whether unbelievers accept or reject the message of Christ, we are putting ourselves in God's place. You hear that? You putting yourself in God's place when you trying to make or force somebody to receive him. That's not our job. That's the Holy Spirit job. Like I said. And it says, a caring and caring a weight he does not intend for us to bear. Dust off your feet. Let it go and just continue to pray. That doesn't mean we can be careless about how we share the gospel or ignore how our lives reflect on our credibility. Do people dismiss our faith because our lifestyles contradict what we claim to believe? Puh. Ask yourself that question. Ask yourself that question. Are they rejecting the word of God because they see you still in the streets, you still in the world, you still smoking, drinking, doing drugs, cursing, out here living in the world, but then you want to be holy, be a holy roller on Sunday? They're like, mm, I'm cool. You understand what I'm saying? It's your life lining up. That could be the problem, right? Check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> now, it says at least some of Jesus' brothers eventually believed in him. James became a leader in the early church, Acts 15, 13 through 21, and wrote the New Testament letter that bears his name. We're talking about um, James. The author, okay, the author of Jude may also have been Jesus's brother. Both men urged believers to put their faith into action and persevere in the face of attacks. Okay, James 2 verses 2 through 26 and Jude 3. Oh, excuse me. And then, and then this is saying, God brings people to himself, but we have an essential role in the process, see whose job is evangelism at John 6 and 18. But let's just go to James 2 and read 2 through 26. So let's just read it and see what it say, y'all. Let's go to James. I ain't got no tabs on this Bible, so bear with a sister. Okay, I just got to flip through it like this. Uh, 
James is a small book. I don't know if he's in the front here. Go, James. Oh, did I lose the page? Oh, okay. James 2. And then we're going to go to verse 2 and read through 26. So, James. So, we in James. Okay. In the book of James. So, we're going to go to 2. Here's 2 and 22. If y'all enjoying this, make sure you put it in the comments if you enjoyed this, okay? 22, where you at? Okay, over here. James 2, 22, and we're going to read through 26, amen? So, here we are. James 22, it says, Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Come on. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messenger and sent them out a way, or sent them out another way. 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Woo, come on somebody. And then it's telling us to go to Jude 3. Y'all see that? Go to Jude 3. So let me... Uh, I just want to highlight this up. Let me pull y'all up a little bit. Oh, this don't have no. Give me a second, y'all. To get a bookmark. This don't have no. Uh... Let me pull y'all up a little bit. This don't have no ribbon. So, um, I just want to highlight this up real quick. Really fast. Okay, all the way to 26. All right, now, um, and it said Jude, where's Jude at? Where's Jude at? Oh, okay, here go Jude, what did it say? Jude 3, so we're gonna go to Jude 3. Jude 3, y'all. Hope y'all enjoying this. Oh, where's Jude? This is it. Okay, that's the introduction. Oh, I guess just Jude 3. I see it. <laughs> that's it. Little small short book. Okay, Jude 3. Contend for the faith. And these are Jesus' brothers, by the way. This is why we're reading this. It says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. So he basically saying, contend for your faith. Jesus. See, I wasn't even going here, but let's go ahead and read this. Contending for the faith. You know, this is how you just get the link. You just connect the dots. Contending for the faith. And then we'll, then I'll end this show. Okay. It says, some scholars believe that Jude's description of faith as having been once for all delivered to the saints suggests a formal and even, what is that? codified body of beliefs and practices, but the body was under attack. 
So Jude urges believers to contend earnestly for the faith. My Lord. The most important battle that early Christians face, faced was not with the Jewish council, the Roman government, or the plethora of erotic philosophies and mystery religions that pervaded the ancient world. The true danger came from within, from people who claimed to follow Jesus, but twisted the truth into blasphemy. Y'all hearing this? Curiously, Jude doesn't name any names except from the Old Testament, sinful Israel, rebellious angels, Sodom and Gomorrah, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Ooh, those was all bad. Did y'all even get to see that? Those was all bad. So, oof. Jude readers, probably Jewish Christians, understood these references as powerful symbols of, of subversion and rebellion against God. I see, I did. As soon as I seen them names, I recognized that as bad, bad, bad. Okay. Jude warned his readers that, like those who caused the ancient Hebrews so much evil, mockers and false teachers were infiltrating the church with poisonous lies that's still happening today we got to be careful and it ain't no coincidence that i'm teaching on this because i'm just being led by the holy spirit so this is a message for somebody well it's a message for me shoot amen and it says yet why did the author not call out specific blasphemy blasphemers of his own day Perhaps the point was to encourage his readers to develop their own um, discretion so that they could defend themselves. Come on. So you got to get your own discernment up. That's why he didn't point them out in this day. Ooh, love it. Or perhaps he was protecting his readers from retaliation. Oh, because they probably would have went and checked them. And he was like, we don't need, we ain't trying to cause no confusion in the body of Christ. They're false teachers, but you need to be aware. Open your eyes and pay attention because they twist in the word. They twist in the scriptures. This is good, y'all. This is good. At any rate, it is significant that Jude's oblique reference recalls Judas. I don't even know how to say that. Eyes are right. The danger is inside the camp. Ooh, it's inside the camp, y'all. It's inside the camp. Jude warned, but you don't always know who it is. Come on. Like the disciples at the Last Supper, Jude's reader would look around and ask, in effect, which of us is it? <laughs> who is it? Who up in here lying? Who up in here still trying to act like they holy, holy, and they ain't doing right? Come on now. In the in the two in the two thousand years since this letter was composed, Christians have always needed to be on their guard against deceivers who lead people astray. Come on, somebody! So true. They will be leading you straight to hellfire if you don't get in this word and read it for yourself. Straight to hellfire. You better get in this word. This book reminds us that faith is no game. No, it's not. And I always be telling y'all, stop playing. It's not a game. Your life is on the line. Your soul is on the line. This is not a game. This is for real. My Lord. The ancient rebels mentioned in Jude come to gruesome end. And so will the false teachers of today. <laughs> My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Live by the truth. <sighs> my Lord. Mm, mm, mm. <sighs> okay, y'all, this was good. This was good. This was good. 
I hope y'all enjoyed that. Let me go back to this real quick because I'm being led to go back because I really wanted to read. Um, and then, I, okay, I said I was going to end it, but I ain't ending it yet. We're going to end it. End it. Not in it. End it. Pronounce your words, Rokisha. Um, let's go. It says, God brings people to himself, but we have an essential role in the process. See whose job is evangelism at John 16 and 8. Okay, so let's go to John 16 and 8 because I did have that marked already. So I do want to hit that and then I will end this. I hope y'all took some good notes. Okay, I hope y'all took some good notes. So we're going to read this and then we're going to be out. I mean, y'all can go do what you do. All right. So this is what we're doing right now. Okay, we're going to read this. Oh, excuse me. And it says, whose job is evangelism? John 16 and 8. And we're going to read 16. We're 16 and 8. Let's read it right here just so y'all can get to know what it is. And it says 16 and 8. This is in the New King James. It says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Who come? God, Jesus. When Jesus comes back, he's going to convict the world of sin. And this is what? The work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. Convict. That's why when you listening to me, that Holy Spirit be convicting you. I know he do. Because I'll be convicted. I'll be convicted <laughs> with my own stuff. Okay? Now, I know if I'm convicted and I'm saying it, <laughs> I know y'all is. Come on, somebody. Now, here we go. We're going to read this. It says, one fact is certain about evangelism. It makes almost anyone squirm. Come on. Whether Christian or non-Christian, bring up anything about religion, let alone the fact of the gospel and the atmosphere turns tense. As John 16, 8 shows, the Holy Spirit is the world's supreme evangelist. Yes, Lord. Yet, other passages urge us to work with the Spirit, to understand our part in this joint effort. We need to rediscover the Spirit's e evangelistic work this involves. Oh, Lord Jesus. Now, this ain't no coincidence because we read in chapter seven where people wasn't believing God. And our job is to, he, our job, we have been commissioned to go out and teach the word speak the word, tell people about the good news, but we got to have an approach. Our life needs to reflect. We should be operating in the spirit, right? Because if we are operating in the spirit, the spirit is going to compel them. The spirit is going to do the work. All we got to do is just bring the good news. Amen. So we got to know our role and stop trying to take on God's role and just play our role. But if we don't know what our role is, how can we play it? Right? So this is about to break it down. These orange things is all about application. That's why I love it. So let's continue. Now, the first thing right here is saying what? Common grace. Common grace. No matter how bad things get in the world, war, Poverty, financial uphe upheaval, disease, crime, family chaos, everything would be far worse if God's spirit did not constantly move throughout the world, restraining evil's full onslaught and promoting good. Come on. The spirit does this for all people, whether or not they believe in God, hence the name Common grace. Common mean is for everyone. Common mean everyone. Common grace. This gracious work prepares non-believers to accept God's offer of salvation. Look at here. Y'all better learn something today. Better hope you're learning something today. Then what? What's the next thing? Spiritual awakening. People who make no claim to following Jesus often talk, um, what is that, ghibli about life and avoid discussing spiritual issues. At least some of this chatter is an, is an effort to avoid the deeper questions of life. 
The spirit breaks through their resistance and shows he has the answers they seek. Come on, Holy Spirit. The spirit may use a disturbed conscience, a lost hope, a tremendous joy, or an overwhelming fear at time he uses the law. Come on. So you might have to suffer something. He may give you that baby that may be born. You may see God in that when before you didn't because you're like, oh my God, look at this miracle, right? Look what you said, oh my God. So, oh my God, look at this miracle. And that make you may just transform you in some type of way, just seeing life being born. That's, a, that's joy, right? Or you might lose a parent. That's sorrow. You can find God in, the, in there too. You understand what I'm saying? So he can use whatever he needs to use. He said lost hope. Okay. Tremendous joy over our overwhelming fear. God will show up. My God, that's good. In the government, he will, God will lose laws. He will use laws. He will use government or human kindness. This is how the Holy Spirit works. He can work through all of those things for, for you to see him. My God, this is good. Conviction of sin. Woohoo. Yes, that always works for me. When the spirit pierces the conscience of a non-Christian, they may feel acute guilt and fear of God's judgment. Woohoo. And then you can find that in John 16 and 8, Acts 5, 1 through 11. Go check them scriptures out. Okay, then it says, this might cause them to attack any Christian within reach. So you got to be careful when that guilt come up on them. You better back up. Give them, give them three feet. No well, matter in these days, six feet. Okay, give them six feet. And then it says, we should remember that their anger is justified if our approach is insensitive. So you don't just be telling them, well, yeah, you can. You're going to hell. Yeah, you, you can tell them, but it's in the, <laughs> in the way you tell them, right? In the way you tell them, right? Don't, con don't condemn them. You just speak on the truth and let the Holy Spirit do his job, which will convict. Amen. And then you be there to catch them when they fall. When they fall into that guilt, you let them know it's okay. We all been there. None of us is perfect. We all sin. You know how you got to get that ready. So then they can feel, okay, well, what can I do to be saved? What can I do to do better? Right? That's when you come in. Bam. Here we go. Then you got to talk about the rebirth. Rebirth involves imparting new life to a repentant person. Ooh, this is going right in line. Go ahead, Holy Spirit. So once that guilt and that conviction come on them, then that's when you start talking about this is what we got to do, right? You're going to be a new creature, right? You start telling them about the new man, and the old man has fallen away. Now you got this new man and everything is clean. So now they hope it's coming back. They, they're starting to live again. But then you got to explain to them everything that's about to happen. You got to let them know about um the, the armor that they need to put on, the war that they're about to enter into, how Satan is about to try to attack them because they're changing their ways and be ready for it. Don't be tempted to go back and let them, let them know. So when those things come up against them, they already know, oh, that's the trick of the enemy and not fall back and start backsliding and let the enemy get them again. So you got to be careful and you got to explain and be clear about what's going on. You just don't just win a person to Christ and then just leave them. No, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. We got to do this right. So, okay, now you got to explain to them the rebirth involving imparting new life to a repentant person, a task only the spirit can accomplish. Come on. As Christians, we can only receive it. And we got to explain to them how to receive it. All they got to do is believe. That's how you receive. Just believe what I'm telling you. We're going to read this word. You believe what this word is saying. Did you read it? I read it. Now believe it. Okay? That's it. That's how you receive it. Just believe it. Ooh, this is good to me. And then what we do? Sealing and equipping. The Spirit seals those who newly believe in Christ. They've been sealed with the blood of Jesus, assuring them that they have indeed met God. Lord, have mercy. The Spirit also equips Christians to live as new creatures by giving them spiritual power and gifts. 
and, in, and bonding his followers together. New appetites. He's going to give you a new appetite. He's going to give you a new appetite to develop a love for scripture. Okay. And a hatred of evil and a desire to share the faith. These come from the spirit. My God, this is so good. Holy Spirit. This is good. If the spirit accomplishes those things, how can we cooperate in the task of evangelism? So that's the spirit job, y'all. The spirit is going, we just got to be here to let them explain the rebirth. We got to explain these things to them, but the Holy Spirit going to do all the rest. The Holy Spirit is the one who's going to give them a new appetite to develop and love the scriptures and hate evil. That's going to be the Holy Spirit job, not ours. Come on now. And then it says what we need to do, identify with Christ. We can start by acknowledging our life in Christ. That's these are some nuggets. I hope y'all writing this stuff down. Identify the identify with Christ. That's something you need to be writing down. All these bullets need to be written down in your notebook. We can start by acknowledging our life in Christ, sensitively yet publicly declaring our spiritual convictions and commitments. We can act with Christ-like love towards others and demonstrate integrity in everything we do. Come on, write these scriptures down. You might just want to take a whole screenshot of this page. Maybe, I don't know. But I hope you're writing down these bullets because these is this is the application. These are steps that we need to take and follow, right? This is how we apply the word of God so that our lives can be transformed, right? Now, this is teaching. This is teaching. Now, here we go. Let me let me scoot this up. So it says, speak the gospel. OK, so first you got to identify with Christ, knowing who you are. OK, I liked it that acknowledge Christ in your life. Don't be hiding and being ashamed. You acknowledge him yet be sensitive, but yet public. You hear me declaring your spiritual convictions. You're the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. Bless coming in and bless going out. All your needs is met. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Declaring our spiritual convictions. You, man, speak your speak that word. Letting people know who you are. I ain't from here. I just live here, okay? But I'm not from here. I am seated at the right hand of the Lord. Come on, my spirit is. Now, here we go. It says, oh, where am I at? Okay, now, after we identify with Christ, knowing who we are, not renouncing him, but knowing who we are, demonstrating our integrity in everything that we do, doing things Christ's way, doing things righteous, which is doing things right, then we speak the gospel. Okay, Jesus preached repentance and the forgiveness of sins. And he asked us to verbally communicate that gospel message. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what I'm on here doing. I'm doing my part. This is what I'm on here doing right now. Communicate the gospel message to others. Our actions alone are not enough to guide people towards Christ. But there must be loving action to accompany our words. We must provide his message clearly, and I try to give y'all, I hope y'all be understanding me, provide his message clearly and answer questions. If you have any questions, put them in the comments, put them in the comments, and I'll try my best to answer them. If I don't know, we can research it out together, okay? Because I'm just learning along with y'all. I'm learning with you. I'm reading this with you for the first time. So let's get it. Okay, appeal for a decision. All right. Ooh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I just feel the Holy Spirit right now. I feel the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Ooh, Lord, you are welcome here. You are welcome here. You are welcome him. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Glory to your name, Father. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I receive it. Hallelujah. Appeal for decision. As the Spirit gives us opportunity, we should present the gospel and then ask our listener to decide what to do. Timing our invitation is crucial. Forcing a premature decision with high pressure tactics 
produces hostility and rejection, and it often creates lasting pain and closes people to the gospel. See, we got to be harmless as doves. What does it say? Something like a serpent and harmless as a dove. Okay. We got to be gentle. We don't pressure and bully a person. That ain't God like. That's what Satan do. Satan just pounces on you. Jesus don't force nothing. It's their free will. You ask them what they want to do. And then if they have questions, you give them answers. Have your Bible. Have Google. And y'all get to it. Right? Man, because we don't know everything. And some things you got to let them know, you just ain't going to know. It's just some answers we just can't answer. We don't know. There's certain things that you just ain't going to have to answer to. You just got to be okay with that. You just going to have to be okay with that. So explain that part too. It's just some things that you just ain't going to know. And you just ain't going to understand it until you turn, get to the other side. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and you got to be okay with that. Now, Train new believers. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It says we cooperate with the spirit by helping new Christians become established in their new life. Hallelujah. That's my job. That's what I know I've been called to do from the beginning because I'm just walking this thing out from the beginning from scratch, y'all. So I'm just showing you how I'm doing it. Oh, my Lord. As like a babe in Christ. It says, like a mother, we can support those young in the faith. Glory be to God. We can help them resist temptation, develop new values, build relationships with other Christians, and gain insight into the Bible. That's the plan. That is my goal. We can invite them to pray with us, discuss God's word, and worship God. Glory, hallelujah. Evangelism is a um, cooperative effort between the Holy Spirit and Christ's followers. As we interact with others, we should ask God to show us how he is working in them and how we can contribute to the process. You hear that? These are, I hope y'all writing this down. These are steps. You ask God to show you how to help them. Jesus, this is good. Okay. We will sometimes so need, well, let me start off. We will sometimes sow new seeds. Other times water what someone else has planted. Come on. Once in a while, we must root out a noxious weed left by someone else that gave them wrong thinking, wrong doctrine. They stuck on trans, trans, um, tradition. So we got to pull that out of them and say, no, this is how you do it. This is the word of God. That was not the word of God. That was man's tradition. That's not what you do, my Lord. Our objective is to reap harvest. Jesus, hallelujah. That glorifies God. Whew. Jesus, that's it, y'all. That's our, that's it. We got to reap harvest that glorifies God. We got to get out here, let the Holy Spirit do his job, and we got to work hand in hand with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So just a recap, if y'all didn't write these down, you need to write down that a person needs to have, I mean, that everyone has common grace. Okay. And then that person is going to come into their spiritual awakening. All right. And then once they come into their spiritual awakening, the conviction of sin is going to come upon them. Once the spirit of conviction come upon them, they will move into the rebirth and want to be saved in repentance. Okay. And then after they get saved and repent, they will be sealed and equipped. All right. And the Holy Spirit, this is all happening by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will seal and equip them. Right. Right. For them to develop a love for scripture and hate evil. And then they're going to learn their identity in Christ. Okay. And then once they learn who they are. Okay. Then they're going to be able to speak it to others. Which is the gospel. And then once they be able to speak it to others. That person will be able to make a decision. 
on if they want to do it. And it's just a vicious cycle. I ain't going to say vicious, but um, uh, um, what's the word I want to use? <sighs> I can't even think of a word, but it ain't vicious. It's just going to be a, a, a good cycle of each one teach one. That's all I want to say. That's basically what I want to say. Each one teach one. Once you get it, then you put somebody else on, and then they put somebody else on, and they put somebody else on, and you're gathering your fruit because you living right, they living right, everybody is happy, and everybody is coming up. There's enough for everyone. Everybody is not sending their repentance. Everybody teaching and growing in Christ every day, right? They get to make a decision. Um, they'll be able to know how to how the timing was to invite someone else. And then we go, then you go into your training and that's where that each one teach one comes. And all that we need to be doing is, is building a harvest that glorifies the Lord God. And this is what makes him happy. This is what he wants his children to be out here doing. Teaching his word. Okay. We didn't do nothing but read the Bible today. And I'm so excited about it. I loved it. I enjoyed it. Chapter seven was off the hook. Y'all can't tell me that that story wasn't good. Jesus brother disbelief. So go and read that on your own in, in whatever translation that you have. Put it in the comments if you enjoyed this. If you want to see more videos like this. Because I'm willing to do them. Because this is what I do y'all. I love this. Amen. So I hope you guys all enjoyed this today. And um, we'll get into it again. And I'll probably pick another Bible. Just so we can go through some different steps. on um, Just doing some different things in all the Bibles that I have. I want to use them and show you guys how I use them. So again, put in the comments if you enjoyed this, if you like this type of teaching, um, and I will see you next time. Pray for me as I pray for you and continue to move with purpose in your relationship with Christ. Make it intentional. God bless. Bye-bye now.